Bijikin Jenkin Jennings, Jason Manadu Newton Schlendler, and finishing the event with a call to action will be Jody Habush Sinekin. And we have an awesome turnout for tonight's event, which is exciting because understanding wolves, their environmental and social importance at this moment in time is vital. Understanding not only the animal, but the collective ecosystem that they inhabit, the communities that rely on them as a partner and resource, and their impact on the fragile lands at risk against climate change. To make progress and increase understanding on these challenging initiatives, we invite you to share your name, your location, and why you care about this issue in the chat box. I just moved to beautiful Wisconsin in July. I live in downtown Madison, which sits on the original lands of the Ho-Chunk Nation. Ho-Chunk means people of the sacred voice, which is quite appropriate considering tonight's discussion. We all share this beautiful planet as well as the responsibility of protecting it. And for this massive challenge, I ask that we engage indigenous peoples for their knowledge and capabilities. Their understanding of nature and the delicate balance of the land and its carbon neutralizing potential are imperative for us as a whole to slow down climate change. Now we need to push and support programs that, that increase indigenous engagement, environmental stewardship in their lands and position them in leadership in this collective climate fight. Now, I ask that you consider how you can help policymakers understand the role indigenous partners can play, sequestering carbon, producing green energy, and most importantly, maintaining the biodiversity harmony our land and we all depend on. I encourage you to understand the indigenous history of the lands that you call home and how you can support those communities today. Uh, the partner slide, please. So here you'll see all the partners who helped pull this tonight's fantastic event together and kick off our new series. We thank them for their continued support and sharing the message of the Wisconsin Chapter Sierra Club. Tonight is our first segment in our environmental justice series, and we are excited to offer bi-monthly information sessions highlighting the stories of environmental justice. On October 7th, we have Emily Ford on race and outdoor recreation titled Through Hiking the Ice Age Trail. Emily is the first known person of color and black woman to through hike the 1200 mile Ice Age Trail. Ms. Ford will be sharing her experiences on this hike as well as her broader experience as a woman of color in outdoor recreation. You can find more regarding the environmental justice series on our Sierra Club Wisconsin chapter webpage. And now I pass it over to Wisconsin chapter director, Elizabeth Ward. Elizabeth. Thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you everyone for being here. My name is Elizabeth Ward and I get the honor of working with Sierra Club's wildlife team. So I just wanna offer a little bit of background about the team that is putting on the event here tonight uh, and the issue. Our wildlife team works to ensure that state leaders properly manage Wisconsin's wildlife. wildlife. This means that all decisions are based on inclusive, equitable, fair, and science-based planning done with the full consultation of the tribes. We've seen very little of that this year. Though our team works on a handful of different issues, wolves have been the focus for this year given everything that has happened and has been the primary focus of this fall and which is why we're putting on this event. I specifically want to thank two wildlife team members, Valerie Gibbons and Amy Mueller, for their work to make this event such a success. I'm really looking forward to it and I want to thank them. The team is all volunteer and so at the end of the event we'll put a link to our volunteer page in the chat in case you'd like to join us in putting events like this on. We're going to have a pretty busy October leading up to the November hunt. Our work is based on ensuring the science-based management of Wisconsin wolves and it has never been more important. Earlier this year, the wolf hunt resulted in 30% of Wisconsin's wolf population being desecrated and a quota overage of 82%. Despite that, the state is moving forward with another hunt this November and the discussion lacked every bit of science, inclusivity, and cons consultation of the tribes when they came up with the quota. This comes at a time when we're facing an extinction crisis, climate change that is putting strain on our ecosystems, and a consistent trampling of tribal authority and rights. Thank you again for your interest in this issue, and we're looking forward to having you join us in this work. We'll get on to the program. 
First, we have the film Family. The short film was released by the Global Indigenous Council in order to highlight the deep cultural connection between Indigenous nations share with wolves and major threats currently facing imperiled wolves in the lower 48 states. The executive director, Rain, uh, is the director or the director of the film, Rain, is the executive director of the Global Indigenous Council and the director of films including Same, Say Her Name, a film described as one of the most impactful murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls documentaries ever, ever made, as well as Somebody's Daughter and Not in Our Name. Rain is a member of the extended Strange Owl family from the Bernie and Lame Deer, Montana, on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. The film stars Crystal Lightning, an indigenous actress from the Enoch Cree Nation. Her credits include American Pie, Bandcamp, Days of Our Lives, Southland, and most recently Yellowstone, and tours as part of the hip hop supergroup Lightning Cloud. With that, we'll turn on the video. The volume is up as loud as it can go, so you should be able to hear it, but if not, you may need to adjust the volume on your computer if you can't hear it as well. Hey there. All right. So that is a powerful video. And um, I, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Okay, good. Sorry, froze. Um, I, I, it's a tough video sometimes for me to watch, I think, um, as a Wisconsinite to see that happening in our state. So to dig into those things further and maybe better understand the, the video kind of gives us a taste for some things, but to dig into that further, um, I'd like to go ahead and welcome our two expert uh, panelists that we'd like to uh, understand a little bit more. Um, so first uh, up, we have Mr. Dylan Bishikins Jennings, I hope I have said that right, um, member of the Bad River Band. He's currently finishing up his PhD through UW-Madison Nelson Institute. He is extremely uh, expert in this field. Um, also former director of the public um, of information for the Glyphwick or Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, so working quite a bit in this area of expertise. And he uh, is also working as a professor at Northland College under the Native American Studies and, Envir and Environmental Studies Department. So quite an expert in his area. And then we also are joined with um, a colleague, um, Mr. Jason, Mandadunanin, I'm not sure, I hope, please correct me when you speak, Jason, uh, Schindler, and so, um, Schlender, I'm sorry, and um, he is a member of the Lakutere Band of Ojibwe, and we are super happy to have him as well. He holds his bachelor's degree um, in science uh, from University of Wisconsin Superior, a master in the arts of tribal administration and governance from the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, again, has done a, a whole host of community um, leadership roles. Um, again, part of the um, chairman of the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, the Voight Intertribal Task Force. So um, knows a lot of these laws, regulations, and things we're gonna be discussing as well. And vice former chairman of the Kudere Tribal Nation. So a, a leader in all respects. So we are beyond honored to have both of these very well educated, very expert um, speakers with us this, this evening. Um, so with that, I guess I'd like to open it up. Um, I'm gonna just ask a couple questions, get you guys talking a little bit, and um, we'll take some Q&A, we'll get rolling. So um, audience, if you wanna be thinking too in, in your back of your minds, we will take a few questions in the chat. Um, we won't open it up to video just for the ease and sake of time, but I will come through chat after we do a few questions. So um, my first question is for Mr. Uh, Mr. Dillon. Um, in the video, you know, we sort of see the, relation to ancient beliefs culturally, and then we kind of see how that relates to and, you know, uh, is kind of in contrast to what's happening today in our world. And so I just want to give you maybe two or three minutes, just if you can expand on what we saw in the video and some of the things that, you know, you're experiencing or have seen or are working on today, I think we'd love to hear your perspective. 
Yeah, miigwech, Amy. Um, ani nga kina uia. Nitsa bija kint indigena kaz. Um, good evening, everybody. Very uh, honored and delighted to to be here with you all, sharing some space. Um, I'm actually right here on the shores of Gichigumi, Lake Superior. Um, that's not a fake backdrop. That's the the real deal. So very very excited to to be here with you all and uh, sharing a couple a couple minutes here this evening to talk a little bit about things that are near and dear to our hearts and many of our indigenous and tribal communities. Um, I think you know what you saw from from the video um, post true to uh, to what we what we see in a lot of our communities, tribal nations all across the United States, Canada, and ar around the globe. You know, our communities um, consist of some of the first environmentalists in our area. Um, you know, we have had a really strong environmental, social, cultural symbiosis with the environment for, you know, hundreds and thousands of years, um, predating contact. And it's a very, it's a very important to note that many of these stories that we're hearing aren't based in any kind of fable or, uh, you know, aren't, aren't myth or, or legend. They're what we believe to be true. And so you talk to a lot of our, our elders and knowledge holders, they'll tell you that, you know, our, our creation stories, our stories are, are true. They're, they're what, we, what we believe in as uh, Anishinaabe, as original people. And so for Ojibwe communities, um, you know, we believe also that we've had this really strong connection with Mayingan is what we call him in our, in our language. And he's our relative. And so part of that story relays a time where we were, you know, very, uh, very new to this place. And it was us in Mayingan that traveled the world to give everything a name in existence. And so I think first and foremost, we have to understand that to, to us, we have, a, we have a very different perspective environmentally um, about our place in the environment, right? Per our stories, um, where I come from and where Jason comes from, we were part of the fourth order of creation. That's what our beliefs tell us. And so everything else in creation from the water to the rocks to um, you know the animals, the four legged the one that's the ones that swim, um, the the plant beings, all of them came before us, and so we were part of the last one. And part of our teachings tell us that you know sub, um, every or, every order of creation sub, that subsequently came after that was somehow dependent upon the order of creation that came before them. And so we, as being part of that fourth and final realm, are dependent upon everything right in creation. And so what does that mean for us is, you know, we need to kind of de deconstruct or decolonize that, um, that notion that we are somehow on, on top of this made up hierarchy, right. As, as man on top of this, this pyramid. Right. And so, uh, you know, our communities firmly, firmly believe that, you know, our relative is, is my Ingen. And so I'll let, uh, maybe Jason has, has some more to elaborate on too. Oh yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Jason, please. That's, um, it is true. It's such a, we have, I think in general, a society, there's such this domination versus coexistence, kind of what you were describing. So Jason, please. Yeah, uh, well, bonjour. Uh, uh, Niji Kawe Mainga Nesha Asian Akazid. Well, um, good evening everyone. I'm I'm Jason Schlender. Um just want to acknowledge my, you know my brother Dylan, uh Bishop Kintz, as that's how you say his name, and to um uh, also acknowledge those, you know, that that video too. So much like what Dylan was saying, you know, there's a, a strong cultural connection that the Anishinaabe people have with Maingan. It goes back to our creation story and how we um, conduct ourselves. And so one thing I'll add to that is um, one of the things that was placed upon the earth for us as, as Anishinaabe people was uh, our clans. There were all these animals and things and beings are already part of our creation. And so uh, being the pitiful human being that the human beings that we are, you know, um, just like what Dylan was saying, we're dependent upon everything else in the world. We, we don't have the ability to do anything. So we rely on everything else. And one of those things that we, one of those things we relied upon is our connection through our clans. And uh, Mayingan is part of our clan system. And so the, uh, there's many of our, you know, kind of our 
you know, um, more, I guess, um, you know, some of the clans that we recognize in different different communities, but one of them is uh, Mayingan. And so what that, what that um, you know, what we learned from Mayingan is what you saw in the video is just kind of like those whole, uh, um, you know, how wolves kind of gather together in packs, travel in packs, live in packs, and, you know, and really do a lot together as family. And we learned a lot about, about family and connection and that extended family also. And that's what clans mean to us. Not only understanding our purpose in our life, but also the, um, the importance of our extended family too, because we always have our nuclear family, our, our parents and our children and our siblings, but there's that extended family too that we rely upon. So in addition to that too, when we talk about Mayangan as a clan, um, it came, they came to us by, uh, by way of our Dakota relatives. And so it was, uh, that's the intercultural or the inner, inner tribal connection that we have with, with the Dakota people. And so that's just that, the, um, the connection there as well. So many people that are, that are of part of the um, Mayangan uh, Dodem, the clan, uh, you can trace back their, their, uh, their lineage through, through Dakota family lines as well as Ojibwe family lines as well. And so that just further just extends our family out there too. So uh, those are some of the things that I was uh, thinking about while watching the video. And one of the other things too I was thinking about is um, um, just how um, uh, media helps in kind of, I don't, I don't want to say helps, but kind of further, it makes it difficult for our, for our relatives, you know, Mayangan, you know, by kind of, uh, you know, you know, reinforcing stereotypes and fear. And so those are some of the things that, you know, that kind of came to mind. So that's all I want to share for now. I'll yeah, open no, you're, she's an add to what you're saying. That absolutely makes sense. I mean, we struggle against the um, sort of wrongly vilified views of Mayingan versus the more um, coexistent and learn from and respect, right? The sort of that the cultural um, tie-ins, you know, that your folks have. And it's just, um, I think a lot of folks on this call can relate to many of the things that that you're you're speaking of. So um, let me ask you this. So we have sort of the cultural tie-in, but then, um, you know, many of the things with wolves go back to sort of the ecosystem too, and, and a lot of the good things that they do um, from a, um, I guess, a viewpoint there, the Lakota Ray. Do you, Jason, do you guys um, focus on promoting any of their benefits? Do you see any of the things that they've brought back in terms of changes in the landscape? Well, I think it's, um, um, it's hard to say around this area, you know, okay. I think it's um, pretty, pretty much dominated by uh, fear-based, you know, propaganda, you know, that goes around. And, and, I, and I think it starts early, you know, I think about like, uh, even when I was, even when I was young and when my children were younger, you know, it's, it's all ties to your, to your uh, nursery rhymes and your fairy tales, right? So it's like Little Red Riding Hood and the Three Little Pigs, uh, the wolf is so you know, bad and evil. And so, you know, a lot, of, so there's a lot of work to kind of decolonize those, you know, those, uh, those things. But one thing I've seen like over, uh, and I, I, and I, you know, I'm not going to state any time frame or anything like that, but I did watch a documentary about Yellowstone and the impact that those wolf packs had there and how it kind of just kind of resurrected that, ecosystem you know over over in Yellowstone and that's you know that's um you know I think you know maybe over time here in Wisconsin maybe maybe we see something like that but it's just so much pressure that's put on the, these wolf packs here in this area that we haven't you know I, I don't I don't have the statistics or mm -hmm. the you know to to show anything but um you know, but I think of like what is currently impacting our deer herd is is the chronic wasting disease, and you know, and you know, I don't know if you know if wolves are a part of that, you know, play a part in kind of reducing that. But I know that they, you know, wolf packs target some of those, you know, the weaker ones in those, you know, in those herds. So, you know, maybe, you know, maybe at some point they do, you know, 
you know, have have an impact at some point. But I just think with the way that Wisconsin has been, um, especially with the, you know, with trophy hunting and the sport of it, um, I haven't really seen anything and, and, you know, it hasn't really been that, you know, that chance. Yeah. Yeah. It's still coming back. To come to fruition, right? Yeah. So yeah. It's, no, you're absolutely right. And that Yellowstone video that you speak of is an iconic one where they show the changes. And so I was just curious. Um, uh, Mr. Dillon, would you have anything to add to that in terms of ecological uh, benefits of wolves? And I know, um, you know, Mr. Jason, you speak of, you know, that the wolves have kind of a bad PR, um, and, and they do. And I think the video tries to show that the wolf is really, you know, the great ancestor of all of our dogs. And so to me, I, I think, you know, they were trying to make that connection of if you love dogs, you know, think about wolves. And um, so it, it's an interesting uh, point that you raise. I think they bring that up on the video that there's, there's a lot of really good things, right? That come from wolves. It's not all this evil stuff. Um, but uh, Mr. Dillon, let me ask you anything in terms of ecological um, things, benefits that you wanna highlight for wolves in terms of the, the tribal perspective. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'd have to agree with everything that uh, Money Dunodin was talking about. Um, and also just make very clear that, you know, it's very difficult because everything is, you know, so relative that uh, it's really difficult for us to even gauge what true biodiversity is these days, right? When we don't, we don't have a strong um, connection or understanding of the, th the things that we, we might think we do, right? We talk about like our, our indigenous knowledge systems have... Uh, uh, really eroded tremendously over the years due to colonization, due to, um, you know, assimilatory uh, policies on the federal government's part. So with, with loss of that, with loss of our language and culture within our Indigenous communities goes a lot of that ecological knowledge, um, you know, that um, identifies um, important um, characteristics of ecosystem balance. And so you know, I think that's, that's very important to note, right? We don't, truly know what we've lost because we don't know exactly everything that we we had at one point right um i i will say though you know i know uh, wolves in general um contribute heavily to to biodiversity right i mean we we acknowledge them as a as a keystone species and mm -hmm. i try not to use that word too much right because in a way it sort of dehumanizes uh, what we've just talked about right where we talk acknowledge him as a as a relative to us as a brother um but, but in general, right, the, the notion of a, a keystone species is that, you know, there's a lot of not only ecosystem services that are, that are somehow provided, um, you, know, um, you know, whether that's, you know, immediate or, or you know, down the line. Um, but there, there are a lot, of, a lot of other things, too, that we probably don't, don't even understand. And so, you know, the notion of, you know, kind of weeding out deer, deer herds, and I know hunters... I, I know a lot of hunters. I'm also an avid harvester and hunter myself. You know, people will, will argue otherwise based upon what they're seeing out in the woods or per, mm -hmm. for their perspectives or through the perspectives of their um, respective hunting friends. Um, but, you know, I think, I think it's very important to, important to note that, you know, they, they play a huge, a huge role um, in the environment. And, um, you know, I think we, uh, we've only scratched the surface on some of the consequences that kind of arise for when, when, it, when a resource or when a relative like that is, um, you know, extirpated in an area. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think there's a lot left to learn. And I think CWD is a big one, right? With wolves and we talked about how um, they, they may be culling that out of the herd in the north, you know, that could be something. So I think there's still a lot to be determined here in our state regarding that. So hopefully we will uh, keep enough wolves on the landscape to find out more and learn more from, from your dear relative. Uh, they're just such amazing creatures. Um, um, before I open it up, um, I guess I just have kind of one question for myself and, and I'll say that, you know, one thing that I was hoping maybe you both could elaborate on a little bit in this, you know, the, the tribes are a little bit uniquely situated with the, the treaty rights and sovereignty for maybe making a play for a little bit more aggressive um, environmental protections, maybe. Um, and so I was just curious if, if you guys could elaborate on, on, on that a little bit for us. So um, uh, I'll let you, Mr. Dillon, if you could start and see what 
what you think about that. Yeah, so through federal treaties that the tribes have entered in, um, predominantly in the 1800s, um, many of those treaties are land session treaties, right? And so land ceded to the federal government um, in exchange for um, things like rations, commodities, annuity payments, and then most notably what we call usufructory rights. Um, the right to ba basically utilize those lands for um, hunting, fishing, harvesting purposes um, to perpetuate um, the indigenous way of life in our, in our area here. And so, um, you know, under, under, under those treaty rights, which, has been, which have been challenged many times in history, challenged by the local states, right? Challenged, um, challenged in, in court, federal courts. Um, you know, what's important to note is that those usufructory rights, you know, have been acknowledged as, you know, the supreme law of the land. So it gives tribes a very unique, um, and I don't like to use the word management either, but a very unique, um, you know, kind of quasi and um, co-management structure with the respective states that they, uh, that these tribal communities reside in, um, which, you know, looks to protect and take care of all of those ceded territories, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, within those ceded territories, right? Um, you know, we don't really have a word for natural resources in our language. Maybe the best equivalent we would use is Wenji Bimatizian, which is like from where we get life. That literally means from where we get life. And so if there's any environmental disruptions to what we perceive as from where we get life, um, that's cause for, you know, that, that could look like an abrogation of our, our treaty rights that could be cause for, um, you know, dealing with things, um, you know, in, in the litigation, in litigation process, right? Um, so, you know, it gives tribes a very unique, unique standing to, to wield their, their treaty rights and their tribal sovereignty to uh, further protect these places that everybody calls home. And I, and I always say this, right, because I've, I know Jason and we, we've both been tribal leaders. We both had to sit in those seats before. Um, many times we're not just, you know, protecting or, or pushing forth with this kind of work just to protect, um, you know, these, these relatives or these resources for ourselves. But I mean, it's for multiple generations down the road, right? We have to all have that seventh generation perspective. And I think that's what a lot, a lot of um, treaty rights are, are grounded in um, and, and our ability to utilize our tribal sovereignty. Absolutely. Very cool. Uh, Mr. Jason, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, <clears throat> I'll just add that, um, you know, just like what Dylan was saying, that we're, um, you know, currently and presently, we're all, we're, you know, those of us that are, you know, uh, uh, you know, we're, um, we're beneficiaries of some very visionary, you know, some very visionary people our ancestors that signed those treaties that, you know, that thought of us, it's our obligation now, you know, it's, it's, it's up to us and how we, how we move things forward into the future. And so just like what Dylan was saying, you know, that seven generations uh, philosophy and mentality with that also just from a, you know, from a, um, from a policy perspective, you know, we had, there's an, there are, through our joint agreements that we have with the state, and with the federal government, there's uh, are there are opportunities for us to to utilize, you know, our our um, you know our agreements to you know for as a as a as a way of protection. One way that we do that is through our quotas that we have that are mutually negotiated between state the, the state and the tribes. And so the um, you know based uh, upon a, on a court case you know back in 1983 with through the void decision um we call it the lco the lco decision but the um um you know it was uh, there was a, there was a formula that was put in place basically that you know the agreement is that um the, the state and the tribes are deemed to be co-managers of the resource and so with that you know, they split the, res you know, the, they kind of divvy up the resource, you know, half and half. And so one, one way we've been able to do that, you know, as far as, you know, when the state declares their, you know, the, you know, and through negotiations with the state, when the, when the state and the tribes declare their, you know, the, uh, the quota, half of that quota goes to the state, half of that goes to the tribes. And so one way we've been able to do that, especially when it comes to, you know, the wolf hunt, is that whatever we declared for the, you know, for the, you know, 
you know, for that work wolf hunt is something we've never, we never harvested. We will never harvest. And so that's a way to kind of protect that number. That's one thing that we, one mechanism that we do, you know, but, but the one way, the, the one, the only, not the only way, but one, the one thing that we will always do is just try to educate people on that. You know, these, uh, whether it's state or tribal leaders, um, you know, to educate people on, you know, um, the relationship between uh, human beings and Mayangan, because I think once they kind of, as they continue to devalue, you know, you know, those species there, that's, you know, we have to, we have to shift that narrative so that we can see more of the positive impact that Mayangan has on, you know, you know, on our ecosystems and, you know, in our, in, in our lives. So, um, a lot of our tribal elders will say that, you know, and some of that in some of that's on us too, as, as, as tribal people, we have our own obligations, you know, not only to be concerned about our, you know, our non-tribal relatives and partners, but we have our own responsibility too. And so if we are, we have to hold ourselves accountable as well. So that's decolonizing ourselves out of the way that we think and also practicing and and carrying out these things and being, you know, and taking care of our relative too. And so, and not being consumed by fear, because I can say that I've been afraid, you know, I've been in the woods and, and have been confronted by and seen wolf, wolf tracks on the ground. And then my, you know, kind of spook myself. But then as I educated myself and learned more about those things, you know, and appreciated, you know, that I wasn't being hunted, right? There was just, I was just coexisting yeah. and, and, and just, you know, doing my part and they're doing theirs. So that's what we will continue to do. Well, thank you so much for elaborating on the, the quota. Cause I know that's, there's a lot of question, right? And that comes up, you know, and I think that was, thank you um, for kind of touching on that. And then you already answered a question. There was a question in the chat that says, uh, do the guests have best practices or strategies for combating the fear and ignorance surrounding wolves? And, you know, I, I think you touched on that in, in a really uh, beautiful way by saying we need to change the narrative, you know, that they're not hunting you, that they're just out there doing what they need to do to survive. Um, so I, I think that um, is a really good way to start, start to look at it. And I'm sure you, I know you guys as both as leaders are out there speaking and trying to uh, change that narrative um, consistently. Um, I'll ask uh, Mr. Dillon, would you like to add anything on strategies to combat the fear and ignorance around, you know, wolves kind of being this, this enemy or this really evil, vicious creature? Yeah, I think uh, finding ways to partner with tribal nations, tribal communities. Uh, many times they already have things in the works, you know, initiatives that they're pushing forth with. And so if there's ways that, you know, um, you can get involved and help support those movements that are already going forth, um, definitely, definitely get involved if you can. Um, I will say, you know, one thing that's really important about this whole story is the notion of history, right? If we look at our history and we look at that original prophecy, you know, an old man that we, we both knew and um, a lot of elders, really knowledgeable elders that we've known over the years talk about, you know, in that prophecy and those teachings that are rooted in um, the environmental symbiosis with, with Mayingan, um, you know, that story talks about how what happens to one will happen to the other. So referring mm -hmm. to us as original people and, and Mayingan. And if you look at history, um, you know, after, after that and you know, throughout the 1800s, especially, um, you know, as Ojibwe communities are suffering and many other tribal nations and tribal communities suffering through um, decades of oppression, cultural genocide, um, murder, everything, right? Um, and assimilatory practices um, in, a, in a way to, to kill our way of life. Mayingan is also mirroring those same, those same issues as, you know, people are encroaching upon their, their habitat, um, you know, messing with that balance, that ecological niche. And so we already have evidence in history of those prophecies holding true, right? Where, yeah. you know, as, as one of us goes, the, the other, other also follows. And so even if you look to this very day, you know, and these are, these are real statistics, right? 
you know, as, as we see, you know, Mayingen being hunted and on, you know, off of that list again, too. We also look at national statistics, um, you know, Native American women are the, the mm -hmm. number three leading cause, of, leading cause of death. The number three cause of death for Native American women is murder, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a big, big movement within our communities um, yeah. for, for acknowledging our missing and murdered Indigenous women across the way. And so I can't help but think about that, right? Yeah. As, you know, there's, there's, there's evidence within our, within our historical lines, but, you know, there's also things going on even, um, even to this very day where they're just uh, dispro disproportionate data, disproportionate statistics that, um, a lot, you know, raise a lot of red flags. Yeah, no, there's, there's so many parallels. You're absolutely right. It, it, you can see it um, very clearly. And I think it really drives home th those, those cultural um, beliefs. It really, it, it makes so much sense. Um, I am looking through the chat. Um, and I'm looking for questions. We have just a few minutes, like maybe time for one additional question if there's any others out there. Um, and um, oh, we've got one here. Um, oh, let's see here. Um, while, while you're looking, I would I want to address there's one there's one question in there about the need to decolonize stereotypes and fear of Mayinga and whether that's on education at a high school or a college level. I think it starts earlier. Mm. I learned about my, I gained my fear of wolves when I was a child, when I was in, you know, Head Start and, you know, and started early in our K-12 system, you know, in a, in a you know, in a public K-12 K system. I think that's where it needs to start, where we have to start, you know, respecting and understand, you know, um, how, our earth works and how in our place in it you know it's like um and so whether that's you know i know some you know there's this whole thing about cancel cancel culture and all that you know there's been movements across this whole country about removing statues and you know and changing books and imagery and things like that that's that's a huge that'll play a huge part of trying to trying to change that narrative because how important is it to have a book called the little three little pigs mm -hmm. how important it is to have the little red riding hood or you know all these all these um things that are just embedded or ingrained in our the early education of our children when they can be you know they can be opted out they should be opted out if we're going to start if we're going to actually start making some initial steps in that way yeah no, I, I agree. I have a seven-year-old daughter and um, the amount of things I've seen, you know, that come her way, you know, being close to this movement. I mean, even in uh, more, you know, movies that are more recent, like Frozen, and, you know, the wolves are kind of that vicious, evil, scary thing. And um, I agree. I think it does start very, very young. Unfortunately, I think um, we need to do more there. So I couldn't agree more. Um with that, I think we are almost here close to wrap up time. I'll just, I'll give it, uh, Mr. Dillon, final, uh, any final kind of thoughts, uh, things you'd like people to take away from this evening before we um, hand it over to Jody. Yeah, I'll also just say, you know, some things to think about. You can definitely write the current administration, uh, Department of Interior, Deb Holland and her team, um, you know, about, uh, about your feelings about this. That, that definitely helps. Um, but I think it's also important to note that, you know, banking on one person and one administration to make all of these changes that we feel um, are necessary to, you know, to, to help our, our ecosystems. Um, it's wishful thinking. We know that those political positions come with this um, unfortunate um, requirement of balance and compromise and, um, and give and take. And so, you know, I, I know a lot of people were disappointed that there was no action, you know, on, on, on this as of yet um mm -hmm. but you know we have to kind of hold hold faith that something something will, will happen and and also just i think more importantly start working and pushing towards dismantling the very systems that kind of constrain our thinking about that and and um you know start to start to reimagine what what a better relationship would look like and you know in my opinion that's always been having tribes at the table, right? Not just at the table to for input, but having the autonomy to make decisions on um, resources or what we call relatives. And so, you know, giving giving that 
giving that, uh, you know, that authority and that power back to our um, original indigenous ways of knowing and our, our knowledge systems and our environmental practices, I think, um, I think you'd see a lot of, a lot of positives come out of that. And so, um, you know, I just, in closing, I just want to say miigwech to everybody that tuned in to hang out with us for a little bit and, and share some really great conversations uh, about one of our relatives. Well, thank you so much. I mean, when we got a sunset on Lake Superior as a bonus behind you, I mean, that's just unbelievable. So thank you. Um, Mr. Jason, uh, any final thoughts? Um, thank you so much for this. This is super insightful and, and we just can't thank you enough. But any final thoughts to leave us with? Yeah, so there's uh, one one thing I, I think about like when we're, when there's like, uh, when we're, you know, where we're pushed to action or action is needed is always thinking of a, you know, a thing my dad always said, you know, my dad was really active as far as our treaty rights recognition and, and you know, the practitioner of our treaty rights. Um, you know, he always said that, you know, a raging river did, didn't start as a raging river. It started with a drop of water. And so, you know, and so those small steps, those little incremental steps that we'll take you know that's where that's what it's gonna that's probably what it'll take you know some grassroots movement some movement that we can build up so that we can you know um you know take those necessary steps in order for protection and you know and you know and just the the awareness you know of my gun if it's you know or anything but then also i guess just in closing too is just this uh, this quote that I just Googled real quick, but from Margaret Mead, it just says, uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And so, you know, with in saying that, it's just, you know, like the, um, you know, I guess just rooting for the underdog, I guess if you can, and if I don't make that, a, you know, not as a kind of a pun or anything, intended toward mining or anything like that but yeah. you know the uh you know just really um just staying can you know you know stay uh, stay committed you know it's 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 worth it you know it's worth uh it's worth the fight because it's uh it's ultimately understanding it's it's our lives that we're talking about you know and 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 it's sad just to see that so many people don't understand that or you know and respect that you know yeah. So no, why. thank you so much for that. And it, I think it's been a tough year for, for any of those involved and in, are watching what's been going on with the wolves. And so I very much appreciate the, the encouragement. I think the resilience that, you know, it is every voice and every little person that does an action, there is, there is going to be a payoff in the end and slowly, hopefully like water, we can, we can wear down the rock right together. So um, thank you so much for that. I, I think we are um, all, I, the, the chat is blowing up with um, wonderful, positive um, thank yous for everything. So thank you both so very much. Um, We're honored to have you with us. Um, hopefully we can do this again because this was really, really insightful for, for everyone on the call. So thank you very much. And the Sierra Club will continue to partner um, with you. And uh, I will hand it over to Jody now because she can give us a couple um, ways to take uh, this information forward and to start to um, be those drops of water in the river to sort of help save our wolves. Well, thank you very much. Dylan and Jason, outstanding information and just the way you shared your feelings and thoughts and information with us is outstanding. I too have been watching the chat come in. I hope you have a chance to look at all the thank yous from everyone and the appreciation for you sharing your wisdom with us. Um, with regard to a call to action, I can just say, and you are aware that Sierra Club Wisconsin chapter stands with the tribes. We stand for the tribes in their legal actions, with their sovereign treaty rights, with their cultural affinity to wolves. And we want to be at your side and, and be counted as an ally of yours, whether it's on the Wolf Management Plan Advisory Committee and litigation efforts, what it may be. And the two of you, um, are just superb representatives of, of the aspirations that you have in which we share for coexistence and for conservation. And what we have been finding is 
there are many people who this has been such a lightning rod issue. When I talk about this, I mean wolf conservation and protection of wolves from um, hunting and the killing interests in the lobby, but there are still far too many people who don't really know. They, they don't have basic information about wolves, ecological value, about the um, sentience and sapience of wolves and their unique family structures and how they take care of each other and what they contribute, not just to um, themselves, but also to our forest systems, which leads, of course, into uh, helping with climate change mitigation, carbon sequestration, keeping the deer moving and healthy and protecting against the spread of chronic wasting disease, Lyme disease and others. There's so much information and you never really know what's gonna be the touch point with a particular person. So we have been really involved with trying to create outreach opportunities with people in the state and of course at the national level as well in terms of litigation support. So we have here on the screen, and it's in the chat as well, that one important way that's immediate is for each of us to contact the Biden administration and demand that wolves be relisted and have their federal protections restored under the Endangered Species Act. It, it is essential, not just in Wisconsin, but I'm sure you all follow what's going on in Idaho and Montana and Wyoming. It, it, it's, it's, it must happen now. We no longer can afford to be bystanders and see it happen again. It was bad enough for us in Wisconsin in February, but to see it spread and what happened in our state energize those wolf haters and killers is, is we just cannot tolerate that. So what we are hoping to really do is to work together and I'm seeing in the chat, whether in our pocketbooks, whether it's by in the voting booths, you know, voting for who we need to represent us by demanding from the federal or the state government officials to serve the majority of people. Um, social science and public surveys across the country, including Wisconsin, show that the majority of people appreciate and value wolves role on the landscape and want to keep them protected. So we need to figure out how we can make that happen. And most of it is like what Jason shared from his father is by working together and making our voices heard. So what, what's coming up for all of us on this call is a number of events in October and it's gonna be on the next slide. And we will be reaching out to you and asking you to help spread the word, to educate, people in your circles, whether it's your friends, your um, co-employees, your family members, let them know that you care about this issue and why. Because we have a lot of work to do to correct this imbalance that exists in our state's Department of Natural Resources, which has for too long been hijacked by this narrow and actually dwindling demographic of trophy hunter, hound hunter types whose recreational fun and killing has been prioritized when the fact is it is not a priority. It is not substantiated by science or ethics or even public values. So we just need to show up. And um, I, I am just so impressed with Jason and Dylan's wisdom and what they shared and actually how in sync it is with the values that we talk about so much on our wildlife team calls. Um, for the Sierra Club group. So thank you for uh, presenting today. And I thank all of those participating, literally hundreds of you who have participated in this presentation and let's keep it going and, and see the change, realize the change that we hope to see. So thank you all. And um, I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you.